If I asked you to make some simple observations about what you see, you might say that I'm sitting in a chair in front of a whiteboard which has an incorrect equation on it, and that my daughter's toy is uh, missing a green piece. Well, if you want to figure out the tricks and the assumptions yourself, hit the pause button now. Because we've already established that I'm not really sitting in the chair, I'm hovering imperceptibly above it. And what if I told you that this isn't, in fact, a whiteboard? It's a shower board from Home Depot. Budget cuts. Or that I'm not missing a green piece, but I'm actually missing a blue one. Or that this is based to math, and therefore a correct equation. And it was you who brought a wrong assumption to it, that it was standard base 10, so that you were the one who was wrong, even as you pointed your finger at me. And I bet you thought this was a fancy hat. Well, guess what? It's just folded newspaper. <laughs> totally got you on that one. In each case, you make an unconscious assumption, in which case, uh, which leads you from the evidence, clear evidence, to a totally incorrect conclusion. Not because you're dumb, but because you didn't have the appropriate training or experience to be qualified to interpret the evidence. So in scientific or critical thinking, you take great pains to identify the assumptions you don't realize you have so that you can account for them and not wind up with a wrong conclusion when you interpret the evidence. Okay, okay, you're saying, let me try another one. I'm ready this time. Okay, this time you'll need a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper. Hit the pause button while you go get one. What I'm going to do is flash an image on the screen for just an instant. Your job is to reproduce it as accurately as you can on your paper. I'll just flash it for an instant and no fear using the pause button. Ready? Here we go. Okay, now press the pause button again and do your drawing. When you're done drawing, play the video again. Okay, have you reproduced faithfully what you saw? Here it is again. See how you did. If you got it right, that means you're thinking more like a scientist, trying to be deliberately conscious of your assumptions. Well done. Most people write Paris in the spring when it quite clearly says Paris in the the spring. Why? Because the human brain is amazing. When it doesn't have the opportunity to fully examine something, a picture, a sound, a social interaction, a political problem, it fills in the blanks using past experience. That's great and really, really useful. But the problem arises when we don't realize we're doing it, because it can cause mistakes. When I get disheartened with all of the really confident and totally incorrect stuff I hear from most people who are skeptical about climate change, I have to remind myself that their brains are just doing what they're supposed to, filling in gaps in a really complicated picture using past experience. For instance, I often hear, how arrogant to think that humans can change the planet. We're so small. Well, now that you're more aware of how bias and preconceived notions influence conclusions, can you identify the past experience coming into play there? It's probably that throughout human history, the weather and climate have always been acting on us and never the other way around. So I guess it's not surprising that people feel that way. But it is disheartening because I wish they would be a little bit more humble to acknowledge that, hey, you might be wrong. Think of it this way. The only way to ever improve is to admit that you might be wrong. Not one of us is infallible. That means that each of us, you and me included, is right now carrying around some beliefs that are mistaken. If we don't acknowledge that we may have some, then we'll never get a chance to get rid of them, to trade them in for more correct or more useful beliefs. That means you'll never improve and will die no more correct than you are now. I don't know about you, but the idea that I am right now as good as I will ever be is oppressive to me, as well as being flat out ridiculous. I mean, what are the chances that you know everything correctly right now? That's one reason why I got frustrated during the online debate about my original video, the most terrifying video you'll ever see. When I reworked my argument in response to some holes that people had poked in it, a couple people essentially said, so why should we listen to you now since you admitted you were wrong before, and sat back smugly convinced they'd won the debate. To them, I lost credibility because I changed my argument in response to the critiques. That's just crazy talk. In science and reasoning, admitting you're wrong makes you more reliable, because in the future, people can trust that if you're wrong, you'll change. If you would never admit you're wrong, you lose credibility because your claims of being right simply become unbelievable. No one is right all the time. In fact, I would argue that it not only increases your credibility with others, but it increases your own happiness to admit that you're wrong. Here's what I mean. Let's say you belong, you choose to belong to that group of people who never admit that they're wrong to themselves or other people. Now, there are two sub subgroups there, those who are actually never wrong and those who are sometimes wrong. So if you're in this group, you're infallible and life is good. If you're in this group, that means that there are going to be times when you're wrong but you won't admit it and bad things happen. Uh, you lose credibility with people, you get into nasty fights, you never learn anything new. Not a very happy situation. 
Let's say instead you choose to belong to the group of people who are willing to admit when they're wrong to themselves and to others. Again, two subgroups, those who are actually never wrong and those who are sometimes wrong. Again, if you're actually infallible, life is all giggles and joy. And over here, when you are wrong and you admit it to yourself and others, good things happen. You have less nasty conflicts, uh, people respect you more, your credibility goes up, and you learn things. So now the question is, which group would you like to be in? Wouldn't you say that there are probably very few of these people in human history, actually infallible humans? What are the chances that you or I are one of them? Since it's almost certain that you and I are going to be in one of these two groups, don't you think the better bet is this one than this one? So how does this work in science? First, as I mentioned, scientists acknowledge that neither they nor their instruments are perfect, and so they always include an estimate of the error or uncertainty in any scientific statement. Second, scientists take great pains to identify and isolate their assumptions, trying to identify and eliminate errors that they may be making. Third, and this is terribly important, they put, the, they put their work out there and ask for criticism so that weak points can be identified and strengthened and the uncertainty reduced. That's sort of what I did with my scripts for this whole project. I gave them to the best critical thinker I know and said, please find the holes in the argument because that's how I know that it gets better. That's why it's so important to ask if the statement you've, you're hearing about climate change has been peer reviewed. That's the official process that science goes through to sift the solid, credible ideas from the sloppy science. Although it doesn't always work, it is a bruising, messy, drawn-out process designed to only let the best, most robust ideas float to the top. If something has been peer-reviewed, generally that means that its methods are up to snuff and the scientific community thinks it's worth looking at. It's getting, it's getting close to the best answer that science can give us. Keep in mind, it doesn't always work. Sometimes a peer-reviewed scientific article is shown to have significant problems. Guess what happens then? The peer-reviewed journal that published the research admits it and sometimes even formally retracts the whole article, apologizing in the process. Why? To increase their credibility. Peer review is the process science uses to get closer and closer to the truth, but it is critical to remember in this whole climate debate, science never claims to actually get there. That's the surprising thing. Science, that most precise and anal of all human endeavors, is also the one to never claim to know the truth. Isn't it ironic? Don't you think? Another dynamic of science that's worth noting is that of establishing when one thing causes another and when the two things are just correlated. Here's what I mean. If you look at this chart, it is clear that as the number of pirates in the world has decreased, the average global temperature has increased. There's the evidence and no one disputes it. So what's the interpretation? 